So, good morning, Facebook. Good morning, world. Uh, I am on today with Asia Lee. I'm so excited to have her here today and to be sharing her experiences. Um, so, I'm actually going to let her give us an interview, uh, an introduction to herself. Um, so, Asia, please introduce yourself to the world. Yeah. So, uh, my name is Asia. Clearly, um, I'm from the north side of Chicago, Illinois. Um, I went to basically a public school in Chicago. Um, went to get my bachelor's in science and marketing, and I got my master's in business administration at SIU. And you know, now I guess I'm living at large and on the north side of Chicago again. North side, of, I've never been to Chicago. So, um, talk to me about what is what was it like growing up on the north side of Chicago? Um, you know, each side of Chicago has its, um, its reputation, I would say, for the north side, uh, growing up there from, I moved to Chicago when I was about eight or nine, so from eight or nine to 18, I would say on, in my, on my behalf and with my experience, it was a little rough, um, just because of the atmosphere that I had to grow up in, the environment that I guess we were forced in, um, it wasn't the best in regards to, you know, financial access. Uh, a lot of us were living on, you know, Section 8, food stamps, things like that, abandoned buildings. So it was rough. It was a rough um, upbringing, but for the most part, you know, we made it through. So. Awesome, awesome. So you said you went to public school. What was that like? What, like walk, walk me through, like, what was Asia's, like, education like? Had it, what were the things that you were going through? Um, you know, and, and, then, and then we'll get to, you know, perseverance and going through college after that. Yeah, for sure. So um, fortunate enough, when I was in um, high school, I was able to join the Law and Public Safety Academy program that they have for um, my high school. It was pretty much for like AP students and more elite students that were getting good grades. And um, essentially, we were going through um, pretty much how to go through like caseworks and things like that, but also a lot of prep for college work. Um, they helped us with um, applying to the colleges and um, applying for internships that we were able to, you know, jot down on our resume for those college applications. And then in addition, I was just, you know, playing varsity basketball. I don't know, I was a hooper um, all through our high school. And okay. um, I would say educational wise, you know, I, to me it was a, an average, you know, it was an average education for those that made it average. Um, but for those that I guess seeked out more, it was, it was better for them. So it just, I guess, Kind of depend on how you took it because the resources weren't there for the actual school. Okay, and so you talk about applying to colleges. Um, what was your undergraduate degree in? My undergraduate degree was in um, marketing. So ironically, I actually went to school. Well, so um, I wanted to go into an animation program and some kind of a natural artist. They didn't have that program at my school that I applied to. Um, one of the only schools that accepted me that had the financial aid that I needed. So I went in business undecided, um, kind of just, you know, thought I haven't had money, so I want to make some money. Um, <laughs> um, so I went in and I decided to get an accounting major, once again, going off of that financial aspect. Um, and then I started taking some marketing classes and realized that, like, the creative capacity that marketing allows you to have um, will be better for me. So I changed my major to marketing and then yeah, like that. And and you're still an artist, correct? You you still yeah. like oh, yeah. create work? What's, oh, yeah. what 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 is like your what's like your thing? Like what's what's your thing? Um I mean I really like drawing cartoons. I'm kind of a cartoonist. But um right now I'm kinda of doing a study of uh Italian Renaissance paintings, kind of doing something of my own there. So Okay. That's awesome. I, I'd love to see some of your comics one day. I mean, some of your sketches, yeah, sure. I, I'd love to see them. I would seriously, yeah. I would love to see them. Um, <laughs> no that's awesome. So, okay. So undergrad, uh, marketing degree, and then you went straight to grad school or did you work in between or what, what did you do after getting your undergraduate degree? And, and yeah, oh, I'm so sorry, one, one more time. Your undergrad yeah. degree was from where again? Uh, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, not the Edwardsville one, Carbondale. And then you went to get your master's? At SIU as well. Okay, so, yeah, same I just school. Stayed, yep, I just stayed at the university. The university, uh, once again, that financial aspect, they provided me with a package that I could actually, you know, live off of and use. 
Um, so during my undergraduate degree, I was fortunate to become like a McNair scholar and they helped me like apply to various other colleges and I actually got accepted into the University of Rochester in New York for my master's studies, but they weren't offering me enough. So it was kind of too far on to me for I just stayed at SIU. Wait, wait, wait. Let's let's take a step back here. You were yeah. you were a scholar. Talk me about that. What what was yeah. that? What was that like? Yeah. <laughs> so they have an undergraduate degree. Um, they have this huge program called McNair Scholars. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, it allows your college application to stand out from the others. So, you know, if there's any students watching this, to speak out for McNair Scholars, it's for um, those the mar minority and marginalized groups of the university. Um, helps you a lot. But yeah, we conducted an eight week a research study. Uh, we matched up with like a mentor, either a professor on campus or, you know, just another student on the campus. Um, and we, uh, we immersed in like workshops um, over the summer and we presented our research at a summer symposium. So that was kind of an eight week thing. Um, my study was essentially like so mine was studying the association between in-group and the out-group theory with marketing for the LGBT community. So it was like all three of those dynamics, how they correlate and how, you know, commercials could be better with referencing the LGBT community and taking our money. So kind of that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So um, you were a McNair scholar and then that was... That was the transition that was while you were an undergraduate still, correct? Yep. Yep. So that actually helped me get into the University Innovation Fellows Program um, that we were a part of with Humera that uh, research and providing those um, results actually helped me with my application for the fellowship. So awesome. I had a lot going on. I had a lot going on, <laughs> but I did it on purpose just for my resume, but I had a lot going on. A lot of po a lot of positive stuff going on, which is, which oh, yeah. is awesome. Which is oh, awesome. Yeah. Okay, so so here we are. Undergraduate, you get a degree. You get a degree in marketing. Uh, you're you're following your your interests with a professional interest that that combines your personal interests of like yeah. creating media and so forth. You become a yeah. scholar. You become a UIF fellow. Which what year were you a fellow? Uh, twenty fifteen. Or, yeah, oh, I think 2015. Okay. Okay. So 2015, you were a fellow. At that point, I don't want I don't want to throw numbers out that I'm I'm not 100 percent on. I'm okay. gonna guess at that point the fellowship, the worldwide fellowship program for the University of Innovation Fellows is probably less than 500 worldwide yep. students. Um, yep. So very selective. So super selective program. Uh, okay. You and I both received that same that same fellowship opportunity. So incredible, incredible stuff. So you come back to uh, to uh, Chicago. You go to grad. You you enter grad school. You apply. You get in. Walk us through that. What was that like? What what was your degree in, and what was that experience like for you? Yeah. So um, I got my master's in business administration. Um, I got it in about a year and a half. I was only on campus for a year and a half afterwards. Um, while I was there. I worked with the university communications program as a social media manager. So I actually got promoted from my undergraduate job that I was doing into the social media um, management program. And essentially I was just going around campus capturing footage for like Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat and all that. Um, um, and kind of interviewing uh, students and colleagues. I kind of made it more of an effort to interview the students and colleagues that were of the minority. Um, kind of shed a spotlight on that. So that's kind of what I was doing. And really throughout that year and a half, I was just trying to find a job that I would like coming out of um, my grad program. And that was kind of corporate. I was looking for corporate America, but didn't get there. That was kind of how grad school went. Okay. Um, so this entire time you're flourishing, you're killing it, right? You are killing it. You're doing incredible work in school, doing incredible community, uh, community service work. You are part of these incredible fellowships, these select fellowship groups. You get your MBA. Uh, up until this point now, what, what were your internship opportunities like? Did you have internship opportunities? Um, what, what was that like for you? Yeah, so um, I was actually fortunate enough to get my internships while I was actually still in school, so I didn't have to do it afterwards. So like um, 
even before I got into college, I got an internship at the Illinois Department of Transportation. So I was already used to how internships work. Um, and I was able to like easily get other ones. So like Rovertown LLC was kind of like a mobile application. And I was more on the sales part, trying to um, sell it to the students around campus and the businesses around campus. So that was one internship. Um, another internship, I went to uh, Denver, Colorado for the first time. It was a marketing oh. immersion. It was a marketing immersion um, internship. So once again, for the students that are watching, if you want to look into that, it's called the marketing a marketing immersion experience. And you go to Denver, Colorado for a week. You go to the big data company, uh, Epsilon. You talk to a lot of uh, professionals there, and you meet students from like Princeton and Howard and all that good good jazz. So um, that would be the second internship and. Yeah, yeah. Other than that, I just did kind of like volunteering. So I would volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club, um, do like um, the academic fraternity sorority events and stuff like that. So. But the the internship, the one you just you just spoke about, that was only one week yeah. long, or is it one week in Colorado and then you spend time at Epsilon? Yeah, so it was just it was one week in total. Um, it's kind of like University Innovation Fellows. They took a select group of people. I was the only one from FIU that went. But yeah, it was kind of like a week long and we just uh, went to that big data company. And to me, it was kind of just like workshops and, you know, we had a, a competition of creating a mobile app and stuff like that. But, you know, it's more of like a design thinking type of thing. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So uh, you, you were proactive, you were seeking out internships before you graduated. Uh, with, your math, with your MBA, which, you know, kudos to you, that's, that's a difficult degree to attain. Um, you've got internships beneath your belt, you've got fellowships beneath your belt, um, and then here you are, graduation day, it's all going to culminate, and what happened next to you? Nothing. <laughs> like, nothing happened, literally, I, I don't know, nothing happened for me, like, as many, I, I believe I applied to about 60 to 65 jobs, um, before I graduated and after I graduated and I was getting nothing. The only feedback that I was receiving is I didn't have enough experience outside of my school. And so the university communications um, department I was working in doing like a uh, web application and digital marketing and stuff like that wasn't enough experience outside of the school in order for me to go into the real world. So nothing happened. And I just decided to work at Menards um, as a front end manager. So I was just dealing with the money because the money and the numbers part was something that I liked, um, the accounts payable and then just managing the cashiers and making sure that all of the departments have what they need. So it's kind of like Eliasin, but I did that for two and a half years before I came back. Okay. I, I don't know when, when, when you said nothing happened, we both like kind of like laughed because that, that, that's the exact same experience that I had, you know, coming out of Georgia Tech. I don't know why yeah. we laugh at that because it's really not, it's really like not funny, but it's yeah, kind of like, yeah. like what you that's expect? the last thing you expected to happen. Yeah, exactly. Yep. It's, I mean, it was tough. I think I'm able to laugh at it now because I dealt with emotions during the time. Like I dealt with the rejection. Um, I dealt with, you know, the thinking I'm not good enough. Uh, I dealt with well, what was so different about me that, you know, you don't have or that you do have. I dealt with all that already. So, like, I guess it just, it makes it easier for me to laugh at it now than it was before. Because I guess before I would, I would be highly upset <laughs> if it was looked at as a joke. I totally empathize with you, trust me. I 100% yeah. totally empathize. Some, a lot of things you're saying, I'm like looking back and I'm, I'm like getting goosebumps. From, I feel like I'm talking yeah. to myself, you know, it's, yeah, uh, exactly. it's, it's a very difficult thing. So uh, about, about how many jobs do you think you applied to? So um, I would say, for, so I would say about 60 to 65 around the time that I was in school. But since I have not been in school to this day, I don't even know if I would be able to count how many jobs, jobs I've tried to apply to. Like I've attempted to apply to jobs in Chicago, outside of Chicago. I've attempted to apply to jobs where I have traveled, so like Colorado or California, places like that. But, you know, you either get, you get the, 
response back that's like, sorry, we moved forward with another candidate. That one's either immediate, you get it within 24 hours, or you get it about two months later, but you deal with that rejection email, or, you know, you get nothing. So it's kind of how that right. progress is. And then um, the time from graduation until the chance where you had to get your first job, I guess? How much oh, time, yeah. like in between, was it like, like how immediate was that? So, but between now, or, or you mean leading up to the time that I have the job that I have now? Yeah, so when you graduated your MBA and you were applying yeah. to jobs, how long did it take before you landed something? Before I landed the Menards job, it was, it was instant. Like, that, that took nothing. So it, it literally takes nothing for me to get the jobs that I don't want. Um, but, like, like, in order for me to even get the job that I have now, which is just AP clerk, um, it took a while. Like, I just got this job last year. And I graduated in twenty or yeah, twenty sixteen. So it'll have been three years um, for graduating with my master's that I even just received a clerk position. So mm -hmm. yeah, so, it's been. So, you know. I've, I've never been at SIU. Um, I've been to Chicago once, and it was in the, the the dead of winter with my cousin years ago. So I didn't really yeah. get to experience anything. I think I had Chicago Uno pizza. I don't know if that counts. Yeah. I don't know if that's like a sin <laughs> to say. Um, yeah. But talk about the, the demographic, the makeup of the students at SIU. What, you know, what, what, what was that makeup like? So um, SIU was a predominantly white university. Like, it really was um, statistically. Um, when I was there, I felt like I was immersed with the Black culture, however, because Black people at that university stuck together. So um, when you're Black in there, you would think you're in a predominantly Black school, but that's because it's... It's, it's very segregated. If you were to look at it from a bird's eye view, um, a macro perspective, you see how segregated it is. But when you're actually living that life and if you're on campus, you'll realize it's just literally virtually who you surround yourself rather than who's there. But it's definitely a predominantly white uh, institution. And what about so like your, your MBA program? Um, yeah. Oh. What, what was the makeup of that? Same thing. So, um, there was a, a statistic out that said like um, one in every eight uh, employee is black. So that's literally how it was in the master classes that I was in. If you think about business in America, or corporate America, the resemblance is white male. That's kind of how all the classes that I was I was in was. It was it was me, black female, and then you know, all other white men, probably about one or two white women. So that's kind of how that was. And then the higher in those grades or in those courses that I got, um, the less and less you would see in black people. So that's just kind of mm -hmm. how that was. So uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't I don't know if you want to like hypothesize here, but your peers you graduated with, do you know, um, like did they land decent jobs? Uh, where are they at now? Do you, do you still keep in touch with them? Um, I mean, the couple that I do keep in touch with, I would say it's 50-50. So I have one friend that is not working and, you know, in the field that he studied in at all. Um, but he was, he actually experienced homelessness right after graduating before he even landed the job that he has now. And then I have another friend who, um, for the most part, she's working in the position that she studied for. However, it's a temporary position, so. Okay, all right. Um, so I, I wanna talk a little bit about the experiences you've had um, with HR professionals, uh, hiring managers. So you're going through this period, you are applying to opportunities uh, in the high 50 to 60 plus range you didn't receive any any offers, um, but what was the feedback that you were hearing as far as like why that was happening? Yeah, so once again, the feedback I was hearing was, you know, I just didn't have experience outside of the school. They were looking for someone that had face-to-face um, -face interactions with individuals and was able to actually um, reminisce on real life activities um, and was able to actually give examples of, um, issues that they've had in the workplace outside of the school. So that's kind of the 
feedback I was getting, or essentially if I was not um, in, you know, the area to be able to commute adequately, then that would be the feedback that I got. Or once again, I got no feedback. So mm -hmm. that was the feedback I was receiving. But honestly, the real reason behind why I felt like um, I wasn't able to get these positions um, is a different story. Do you want to share why you think that why, why you think that was? Well, yeah, I think uh, the issue that we have um, is, you know, it's not so much that the employers are biased or the employers have racial bias. I think is the employer is scared or nervous about how their employee will look to their customers. So they don't want to lose that long-term customer they've had for about five to seven years bringing their company re uh, revenue, that 80-20 rule, right? So um, statistically, it's been shown that like um, Black people are more than likely to be rejected from a sales job than they are from, let's say, office automation job or where they're sitting behind a desk. And that's, you know, just mainly because um, they're afraid of how you'll look to their customers. But that's just kind of how I feel about it. You know, it's, it's that cult, the whole culture fit thing that they try to place on it. Um, you know, you're not always the right fit. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. um, can, you, can you maybe walk, walk me through uh, and walk people who are watching through right now, the, some of the things you shared with me as far as, you know, how appearances has affected you and yeah. being part of uh, you know, marginalized communities. Yeah, so me, I identify as a, a black woman, a part of the LGBT community. So that's three marginalized and minority groups of America right now. Uh, we're looking at black women who are making, you know, 64% of the white man's dollar, 17% less than, you know, the white woman or the white counterpart. Um, and then, you know, you look at the rates of the LGBT community and how they're doing in the labor force. Is is just there's a lot of elements about who I identify with that, you know, the U.S. has stereotypes against, and those stereotypes are shown through microaggressions in you know corporate America or in the workplace in the labor force, and um, you know it's just hard. You know it's it's hard to connect with, you know, the individuals that like, you've never talked to or that you don't identify with, but, you know, it comes with experience, it comes with education. So. Mm -hmm. how, how have you coped with those sort of things, like those experiences? Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, it's kind of, sometimes it's hard to cope. You know, I've dealt with both microaggressions and very direct, like, racist issues, like, you know, Missouri is honestly one of the most racist states in the United States. So when I was living there and I was working at Menard, um, I did have to deal with a lot of, you know, white people directly calling me, <laughs> you know, things that you shouldn't be saying to a black woman. But, you know, you deal with that. You deal with the people wearing complete Nazi outfits from head to toe. You know, they don't care, they do what they want. You deal with that, so you deal with the direct, but then you deal with the microaggression, which is essentially, you know, you got a people at a lunch table sitting, you can't sit here and look. You know, you don't have to say it, but the way they look at you just tells you that, so. Um, but yeah, just going back to it, I feel like dealing with all of that and having to deal with that, my coping mechanism is simply to realize that I'm better than that. You know, I will always be better than the things that are turned against me. Regardless of what it is, I'll always overcome that. So if it was me, 18 years old and experienced, I wouldn't be able to say that right now. You know, I, my coping mechanism back there would probably just be angry, like to be angry and be spiteful towards everybody. But, you know, with time and experience, education, I'm here today and I'm able to actually just you know, realize that I'm bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, um, do you feel like you, you, so one thing that we, we talked briefly yesterday, you and I, and you know, I talk about, I, I don't know how to be any, anything else than myself. So I bring my authentic self to the experience yeah. that mm -hmm. I have around me. So 
uh, with yourself, do you feel, do you feel like you have had to find that you are altering what you what you view as your authentic self because you're looking for acceptance, um, mm -hmm. you're looking for people to view you a different way. Are you mm -hmm. trying to shield parts of you of your of your authentic self? So, what 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 that, what has that been like for you? So, it comes like it comes a time where you know as as a person, when you're tired, you get tired. Like when you're done, you're done. So when you're my younger self, I was so busy trying to be accepted. Um, I was so busy trying to look good in front of the next person. But as you get older and you realize, regardless of what you do, how you look, the way you talk, whatever demeanor, someone is going to have something to say. I've been authentic ever since then like there's nothing else that i can be because regardless of where you turn there's always going to be someone pushing you back so i mean i can only be my authentic self and if i'm not it puts me in a place that i don't want to be you know so i have to live with myself daily i have to live with myself 24 7. and if i'm not who you know i am authentically with myself by myself i wouldn't be a happy person Absolutely. That's, that's, that's really strong and powerful. Uh, I think mm -hmm. a lot of students out there, a lot of people out there, uh, they are trying to understand how to be their, their authentic self, mm -hmm. um, what does that mean for themselves, and how to feel comfortable, whatever that authentic version of themselves is, but how to right. feel comfortable, uh, not just in the, just around the world, but just you know, also in like, the workplace. Um, yep. So, I, you know, I, I, I really appreciate you know, you sharing your story um, today. Mm -hmm. I would like to know, um, you know, what sort of advice you have for um, students who are coming out of school now or who have graduated? Um, what sort of advice do you have for them who maybe are experiencing things that are parallel to your experiences? Yep. So, um, the one thing that I preach. To a lot of people, although I'm a scholar and I went and got my education and everything like that, um, I wouldn't advise going to get a degree and pursuing your further ed education if that's not something that you really want to do, like you passionately want to do. Because at the end of the day, you will go into debt um, trying to obtain this degree that you weren't really trying hard for, even if you go in there for one semester. So. There's so many other opportunities you can do um, to get where you want to be. So, you know, entrepreneurship, definitely considering something like that. Um, I would say just don't go to school if it's not something you passionately want to do. Um, mm -hmm. It could backfire big time. And then the second piece of advice I would say is, you know, get involved. A lot of people tell you to get on, get involved on campus, get involved for sure. Um, but don't get involved to the point where you lose what you're striving after so um there's so many like the when you get on a university it's so saturated with programs and organizations and different things that you can do make sure that you have a goal um because your first semester can turn into your last semester very fast um and you can lose it real quick so just make sure that you have a goal and you know where you want to go that would be my advice okay and, uh, and I almost, I almost skipped over something. You said to me some. You told me something yesterday that I told you. I want to put that on a T-shirt. I want to put that on a hat. And we were talking about, um, we were talking about, sort of the the shared experience that you and I both had, where like the rejection from companies and some of the things yeah. you hear are, you've got, you look great on paper. You've got all these things. Um, yeah. However, um, like you don't have internships. And we, yeah. you said something to me. That I want, I want to, I want to say, this, I want to say a slogan in a moment. But you mentioned something to me about, you know, that's like the access, the support. Like I didn't, I didn't yeah. have someone. So if you, oh yeah. If you talk about that. Like you know how, you know how, how did, how frustrating is that? You know how, what was like for you? Like I don't, I'm, I'm the first to do this. So literally, yeah. So like a lot of people, I'm first generational. So you don't have many role models growing up. You don't have really a lot of people that. Um, you can look up to and to ask for advice. Um, a lot of the time you're a self learner and you're, you're teaching yourself how to go day to day. You can't, even at the minor level, you can't ask your mom or your pops 
to help you solve this algebra equation because they didn't have the chance to study algebra. Like they didn't go that far. And like, even to make it at a macro level, you can't ask your uncle to assist you with getting into that job you've been looking at since before graduation. Um, you just can't do it. Like you don't have access to that. And it makes it hard because <laughs> you look at your counterpart who's sitting in the chair next to you and you're like, wow, like you're dumb. Like you're dumb. How do we get here together? How are we sitting here together? Like you have, <laughs> <laughs> like you, it doesn't make sense. I don't know what's happening. So it's like, how did I get here and you're here with me? Like it doesn't right. make sense. So it's very frustrating because you know for a fact they did not get there by their competency. They did not get there by their academic level. They got there by somebody that they know. So it's it's just really frustrating. It's like you have to work three times as hard to get really anywhere. Um, but that's kind of how the world is set up, and it it sucks. Mm -hmm. I say that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I I I 100% know that feeling as well. When you look around, you right. think, I I I know I have, I busted myself to get here, and I know I bust exactly. myself every single day to stay here and look mm -hmm. at my peers, and you know. That's that's how I, I felt yeah. when I went when I went to uh, Colorado, and I went, I was with students from like Princeton and Harvard and all this stuff. And I'm just like, man, like how? That's just how. That's all I like to know. So. But then yeah. again, you can't. It's about having like, I guess, a strong resilience and realizing like, I'm, I'm smarter than you. I'm more humble than you. Like at the end of the day, my karma is gonna be better than yours. And it's like that we have to think about it like that. Like the universe is gonna serve us, um, but it's, you know, it's how it goes. Okay. And I just, I just wanna drill down a little bit deeper. Um, for someone who may, who's listening and watching right now, when you said that going to grad school could backfire big time, um, just like, what do you mean by that? How, how do you mean by the backfire? So I, I know a lot of people that went to grad school or even just their bachelor studies and they probably went about five times before they actually like finished with a degree that they actually like and actually can do something with. And to me, I'm all about being frugal and saving money. So if you're gonna go to school five different times and get five different degrees, I would hope the degrees correlate in some way where it's like pushing you to a direction. Um, and, you know, that again, I don't, I don't know. But it can push you back when you don't have the money to make up for it and the resources. So I'm talking about somebody from my degree. I'm not gonna talk about somebody with family fortune, you know, or somebody in my degree can backfire because you do have to pay for that stuff. So, mm -hmm. okay. If yep. you could, um, I, I kind of asked you this yesterday a little bit, and I don't know if you, if, if you, you know, I'm sure you have one, but if you could like wave a magic wand, um, where would where would Asia be? Like, what, what, where would she be? What would she be doing? Um, if you could talk directly to a company like right now, a CEO, and say, hey, look. I'm, I'm out here. What would you say to them? Um, well, for the first question, if I can wave my wand, I would probably be in an undeveloped, underdeveloped country just because I want that experience. Like, I feel like we're really entitled here in the United States. Uh, we have access to so many things. And I just want to know how it feels like I, I want to know and be able to connect with those people like, hey, we don't have clean running water and where they go to get the access to that because everything is not like granted to you. Everything that you have today won't be here tomorrow. So just to be able to connect with that on a deeper level would be cool. So that would be my wand. And then if I can talk to a company. Um, um, let me think good on this one. I would probably talk to <sighs> who would I talk to? I don't know. I guess I would talk to probably uh, uh Nike. <laughs> I would probably really talk to Nike just because Nike's my favorite brand. I will not lie about that. Um, I love Nike, but I basically I just I would like to tell them to kind of. I've applied to Nike before and the recruiting aspect of it, um, 
it's not very centralized. So I would ask them if they can please centralize that so the people that are applying outside of the headquarters um, will have access to the people that are in the headquarters in Oregon. That will be my my request. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And 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 uh, what would you be doing there? Um, I probably would be um, doing like. Uh, like the sketches of the actual products or like the sketches of the shoes if I could do that like if if education didn't matter like I didn't have to go to design school and all that stuff and I could actually use my natural ability that's what I would be doing <laughs> that's awesome when I when uh my final year at tech I took uh there's an elective for uh footwear design hands yeah. down I've always said it's been my favorite yeah favorite. exactly right class hands down always yep. I'm, I'm gonna send you some of uh, the work that i did so but hands yeah, down my favorite class hands down yeah um, i didn't really like i went in for a business just because i felt like i had the art side for my natural ability so i'm like maybe i could learn the business aspect to sell myself but now i regret not taking any of the technical classes because now they're like you know you got to have such and such thing right right well I really had a great time today listening and learning uh, from you. Um, I'm glad that you had the chance to connect today on, on live. And I'm glad that you were able to share a bit of your background here. Um, I, I invite you to always come back and, and mentor or share more, um, you know. So I just want to say thank you very much um, yeah, for, sure. for coming on today. I really appreciate it. I know the community really appreciates it. And it's going to do a lot of good for um, for, for for people out there in the world watching. Right, thank you for having me. <laughs>